Now, I'm not one to gossip, but I will bring you the tea. Welcome to Chronicle Speaks. Please, please, I don't have any time for any gossip now. Mm -hmm. Eh? Yes. Look at you. So as the saying goes, what's done in the dark will always see the light. And the light that's currently shining on the diddler is definitely shining bright like a diamond and it's nothing he could do to stop it. Can't stop, won't stop. Diddy has been hit with yet another lawsuit, this time from a woman by the name of Thalia Graves, who's an alleged victim of Sean Diddy Combs, who has decided to speak out publicly for the first time about her lawsuit against the disgraced music mogul. Graves sat down with her attorney, Gloria Allred, today. She was emotional and even breaking down at times. She accuses Combs and another defendant of SA and states that the incident was even recorded when it happened in 2001. And not only that, it's also being said that the video was even offered for sale. We are going to break down this new Diddy lawsuit and so much more, but before we do, please be sure to subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss out on any news regarding this story and so much more. Now let's get back into it. If the chain of events regarding these court documents allegedly involving your boy Diddy are indeed true, it seems like karma has definitely caught up with him. The essay alleged in the new lawsuit filed today in the Southern District of New York is probably one of the worst that I have read in this Diddy saga, so brace yourself, people. Trigger warning is advised. Introduction. In or around the summer of 2001, plaintiff's life was violently knocked off course when defendant Sean Combs and Joseph Sherman viciously aired her at the Bad Boy Records studio in New York City. Plaintiff was 25 at the time and dating one of Combs' employees, a relationship that Combs exploited to lure plaintiff into meeting him and Sherman alone. Once they successfully sequestered plaintiff, Combs and Sherman gave plaintiff a drink, likely laced with a drug that eventually caused her briefly to lose consciousness she awoke to herself bound and restrained. Combs and Sherman proceeded to brutally essay and violate plaintiff. Combs mercilessly art the plaintiff both back door and front door. Sherman forcefully slammed plaintiff onto the table, slapped her, and repeatedly thrust his Johnson into her mouth. Both men were undeterred by plaintiff's cries for help throughout the attack. Plaintiff never recovered from defendant's violent R. She had thoughts of taking her life in ideation and had received extensive psychological treatment because of defendant's attack. For decades, she remained silent and did not report the crime out of fear that defendants would use their power to ruin her life, as they had repeatedly, explicitly threatened to do. To this day, plaintiff suffers from severe depression, anxiety, and panic attacks, and still lives in fear of defendant. Any progress plaintiff had made in healing from the attack over the years was dramatically reversed on or about November 27, 2023, when she learned for the first time that Combs and Sherman had video recorded the horrific R 22 years before and had shown the video to multiple men seeking to publicly degrade and humiliate both plaintiff and her boyfriend. Plaintiff could not believe that defendants would record themselves committing such a gruesome crime and then proceed proudly and widely to disseminate the recording of it. She was distraught and sunk into a deep depression. She again considered ending her life. This action seeks redress for defendants, brutalizing misogynistic and violent attack on plaintiff starting in 2001 with the R and continuing in the subsequent years as they compounded her humiliation by showing the video of the SA to others. Factual allegations, background. Plaintiff's family immigrated to New York City when Plaintiff was a teenager in connection with her mother's work. Her family ultimately settled in Rego Park, Queens, where she completed her education and where she was living when she met Combs. So the next part introduces Combs. We already know him, so let's go to the next defendant, Mr. Sherman. Defendant Sherman, also known as Big Joe, was employed by Combs as his bodyguard and head of security during the relevant time period described herein and served in various roles in the Combs Corporation. Sherman is also the founder of Rhymes and Dimes Magazine Incorporated, a New York State registered corporation, and through or in connection with that company, produces and distributes P-rated videos. On information and belief, he often distributed videos of his and or his friends as assaults through his P company. Plaintiff met defendant Combs in or around late 1999 or early 2000 through her then boyfriend who was an executive at Bad Boy. In addition to working together, plaintiff's boyfriend and Combs had a close personal relationship. Over time, plaintiff became familiar with Combs as he knew about her relationship with her boyfriend. Next part, defendant Trick 
drug, and violently are plaintiff. In or around the summer of 2001, plaintiff received a call from Combs concerning her boyfriend's employment at Bad Boy. He told her he wanted to meet with her in person to discuss her boyfriend's supposed performance issues. Her boyfriend was determined to climb up the ladder at Combs' record label and as his romantic partner, plaintiff was committed to helping him. Plaintiff agreed to meet with Combs. In retrospect, it was evidently a sick and twisted way of using his ownership of the title at Bad Boy and its affiliate entities to abuse plaintiff and also also show his ability to humiliate her boyfriend, his executive. A few hours later, Combs arrived at plaintiff's mother's residence in Queens with Sherman who was employed by Combs as his bodyguard at the time. Sherman was driving an SUV and Combs was in the back seat. After plaintiff entered the vehicle, Combs offered her a glass of wine which she accepted. Combs began discussing his alleged concerns about her boyfriend's performance at work. Meanwhile, as plaintiff began to drink what was handed to her, she started to feel lightheaded, dizzy, and physically weak. In retrospect, it is clear that Combs had caused a drug to be put in plaintiff's drink as a few sips of wine have never impaired her that way. Combs and Sherman drove plaintiff to the bad boy studio in Manhattan. When they arrived and plaintiff tried to get out of the car, she realized that she was feeling odd and found it difficult to walk. She assumed this was her fault and did her best to act normal and followed Combs as he led her eventually to a couch in a private room in the bad boy's studio. She later came to understand this was Combs' personal lounge and office at the bad boy's studio. Combs sat on the couch next to plaintiff and continued to speak to her. Plaintiff began feeling even more woozy and sedated. She then lost consciousness. When plaintiff regained consciousness, she was naked and her hands were tied behind her back with what feels like a plastic grocery bag. Plaintiff shouted for help. In response, Sherman lifted her from the couch and forcefully slammed her face down on what was apparently a pool table. Shortly thereafter, Combs entered the room naked. Combs reached for a container of lubricant that smelled like menthol and proceeded to apply it to his Johnson. He then bent plaintiff over the table, causing her feet to dangle above the floor, forcefully held her down, and went through the back door without her consent. Plaintiff is four foot 11 inches tall and weighing only about 103 pounds at the time. Plaintiff was unable to move, totally overpowered physically, in addition to being drugged and bound. Plaintiff screamed out in pain, but Combs continuously and violently went through the back door without her permission. He easily physically overpowered her, smashing her head down on the pool table, which she futilely tried to wiggle out from under him. During the brutal attack, plaintiff vomited into her mouth and on the table. At one point, she involuntarily defecated. Combs was undeterred. He wiped himself off, applied more lubricant, and without any acknowledgement of plaintiff's distress, proceeded to go in through the front door without her permission. Plaintiff experienced intense pain and burning sensations around the front and the back door. Plaintiff continued to scream for help because of the extreme pain she felt as Combs penetrated her over and over. She then lost consciousness again. The next time she regained consciousness, Plaintiff was on the couch and Sherman was standing in front of her with his bare Johnson in her face. Sherman slapped Plaintiff in the face and forcefully inserted his Johnson into her mouth. Sherman slapped her yet again and continued to thrust his Johnson into her mouth. She once again lost consciousness. When she next awoke, Plaintiff was on the couch naked and alone in the room. Plaintiff was in severe pain and distress. Her front door and her back door burned, her face and wrists were bruised, and her womanly area smelled strongly of menthol. She felt a liquid, presumably male fluid, dripping out from inside of her. Her dress was thrown over her, her purse was on the couch next to her, and her bra was on the floor nearby. She did not see her underpants. Terrified that Combs and Sherman would return, Plaintiff quickly got dressed and bolted out of the studio room where she had been aired. Still dizzy and weak, Plaintiff called a livery driver that her family regularly hired and knew well. The driver picked her up from outside the bad boy's studio. She was disheveled, crying uncontrollably, and suffering from agonizing pain. The driver drove her to the hospital and tried to convince her to report the R and get an R kit, but she was unable to leave the car, shaking and crying hysterically, and terrified of what Combs would do to her and her family if she reported him. The aftermath and impact of the R on plaintiff. Plaintiff sustained serious physical injuries in the aftermath of the R. As noted, she had burning in the front and back door and bruising on her wrist and face. In the days after the assault, she suffered prolonged back door bleeding and hemorrhoids. Because of Combs' power and notoriety, plaintiff was afraid to report what had happened. She was involved in a continuous divorce and custody battle at the time and feared that reporting the R would cause her to lose custody of her young child. Plaintiff confided in her boyfriend, Combs' employee, hoping he would comfort her and support her, but instead 
instead of supporting her, he discouraged her from disclosing the assault, telling her that it would negatively impact his own career. Following the assault and multiple times over the years, both Combs and Sherman contacted plaintiff and warned her to be silent, threatening repercussions including plaintiff potentially losing custody of her son if she ever disclosed the assault. Because of the enormous power in the industry, including through their ownership of and positions at the Combs Corporation, plaintiff knew that they could follow through on their threats. Plaintiff told close friends that Combs and Sherman had drugged and savagely awed her, but as noted was afraid to report the attack to the police out of fear that the defendants would follow through on their threats. She was even afraid to stay in New York City while Combs lived there, so with the help of a friend, she fled to Pennsylvania. Plaintiff has, in fact, relocated multiple times throughout the years in an effort to stay away from Combs. Plaintiff has suffered irreparable harm because of the brutal R by defendants Combs and Sherman. She suffered from severe depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. She has also suffered thoughts of taking her own life, ideation and intrusive thoughts, and also attempted to end her life. Plaintiff lives in constant fear. She struggles with hypervigilance and experiences anxiety and panic attacks in social settings. Preferring to be alone, her need to hide to feel safe has strained her relationship with friends and family. Defendant's R has also impacted plaintiff's ability to engage in sexual acts with her intimate partners. To this day, she cannot be in certain sexual positions without experiencing flashbacks of Combs violently penetrating her from behind. Plaintiff learns that the R was videotaped and published on or around November 27, 2023 all the trauma of the R came flooding back to plaintiff when her former boyfriend revealed to her for the first time that Combs and Sherman had recorded and published the video of the horrific attack. Earlier that month, Cassie Ventura had come forward and filed a lawsuit against Combs for subjecting her to years of severe S and physical abuse. The case had been settled one day after it had been filed. Plaintiff's former boyfriend invoked Miss Ventura's effort to hold Combs as accountable and for the first time confessed that years earlier. But sometime after the actual R itself, Sherman and Combs had shown him and a group of men, some of whom were employed by Combs' companies and or related entities, the video of plaintiff being R. He disclosed that Combs and Sherman had a pattern and practice of non-consensually recording women engaging in S acts and making those videos available to the public, including selling tapes as P videos. A bad boy artist later corroborated in a text message that Sherman used or used to sell P videos of him doing this to chicks, and that Sherman did that to a lot of women. Plaintiff's former boyfriend reported that he and the other men watched the recordings of Plaintiff's R on a handheld camera while at the Bad Boy studio in New York City. Combs, Sherman, and some of the other men made derogatory comments about the former boyfriend's relationship with Plaintiff in an attempt to shame him into cutting ties with Plaintiff and to cause her further emotional harm and embarrassment. On information and belief, defendants continued to show the video of the R to others over the years and through to the present and or sold the video as P videos. Plaintiff was shocked and and horrified that Combs and Sherman had recorded and publicized the video of them R and her. After over two decades spent trying to heal and distance herself from the experience, Plaintiff was devastated by the news. She felt as if her life had been turned upside down again and like the R had been happening again and again, even as she was trying to forget it. She experienced acute psychological distress, plunging into a deep depression and having ideas of taking herself out. She felt intense fear, anger, and anxiety. Plaintiff lives in the distress of knowing that the video of the brutal R is in circulation and that anyone, including her family, friends, and peers could view it at any time. In a panic, she reached out to Sherman after learning about the tape, hoping to protect herself from further humiliation by conveying him to destroy the tape or to provide it to her, but he did not respond. She is filing this lawsuit under the violation of New York City Victims of Gender Motivated Violence Protection Act, violation of New York City Civil Rights Law, and violation of New York City Administrative Code 10-180. She is seeking compensatory damages for all physical injuries, emotional distress, psychological harm, anxiety, humiliation, physical and emotional pain and suffering, family and social disruption, and other harm in an amount to be determined at trial. She's hoping to be awarded punitive damages in an amount to be determined at trial, awarding attorney fees and costs pursuant to any applicable statute or law, pre and post judgment interest on all such damages, fees and or costs, attaching any and all defendants real property and other assets located in the state of New York, ordering defendants to account for and destroy all copies of any and all images and videos taken of or in connection with Combs's and Sherman's S assault of plaintiffs that are in the actual or constructive possession, custody or control. Oh. 
all enjoining defendants temporarily and permanently from further disseminating or publishing any intimate images or videos of plaintiff and awarding each other the further relief as this court may deem just and proper. Out of all of the Diddy lawsuits that I've read, this one has probably been the most explicit, the hardest one to read just for the simple fact. If it is in fact true, this lady went through a lot and no woman or any person in that matter deserves that. I pray that all of the victims get their justice soon and very soon. What I need to do is hear from you. What do you think about this new lawsuit being brought against Diddy? Leave a comment and you know how we do. We'll talk about it down below. Talk to you guys later. Bye. As always, thanks for watching. But before you go, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video, and hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss out on any of my new episodes.